The criminal organization known as the Mafia has long been a solid part of our culture in America. We've seen it through films. I did a little bit of a deep dive. And one of the first films they had was, um, it was, uh, you know, old black and white film. And um, the character in that film is a typical, you know, 1930s, 1940s uh, New York gangster. And there's a lot of uh, uh, scenes uh, of, yeah, I think there was like a, it was about the speakeasy era or right after that, something like that. And the actor's really good in it. And that's actually the character uh, that Al Pacino in the 1980s uh, used as an inspiration for his um, for his Scarface character. And ever since you know those old Hollywood films, America has always had an interest a fascination with uh, gangsters. Actually, I think gangster films were a Hollywood invention. They were as American as Westerns. It's a whole genre, basically. And the... I don't know what it is. Like, what fascinates us so much about organized crime, especially the mafia, right? And we've seen it also in, in, in lots of music, right? Uh, especially like in the era of gangster rap, a lot of uh, rappers who either portrayed themselves as gangsters or um, as, you know, criminals, would use lots of the times either the mafia references either directly in the lyrics of their songs or they would also uh, adopt the the word mafia into uh, their artists names or you know groups like three six mafia so stuff like that so is it, there's always been an interest at all levels, right? Whether it's the Scorsese film or uh, sing, you know, singing and rapping about a specific type of lifestyle. And I guess you could say that with the same analogy as Western films and gangster films, both, you know, as the the cowboy has uh the western right that's the protagonist is the cowboy and the cowboy what the cowboy represents is uh, specifically the uh the 19th century american west right the 1800s in america where there was you know half the continent had to be uh, conquered, right? They had to uh, invest the money that uh, the tycoons in New York, the Wall Street bankers, were um, were making, and they they wanted to invest in the land, and also from a government point of view, you know, they just wanted the total control of the american territory right and that's what we have today is the result is in america so the cowboys in the westerns definitely were a um a symbol a strong symbol of how america was created uh in the 1800s now i would say in the same tone in a way the the figure of the uh, the gangster, the uh, mafia boss, 
that was also a symbol of how uh, a, a good part of America was created in a certain sense, right? If you think about especially cities like New York, uh, Philadelphia, Chicago, uh, Boston, Miami, Las Vegas. I mean, Las Vegas was literally created by the mob, by the mafia. So the, the mafia has such a long history and such a huge um, reach, not just over time, but also in terms of uh, also in terms of geography, right? I mean, it spans continents. So I tried to do a little deep dive and try to understand what it is and why are we so fascinated with it. You know, why is it so, such a big part of uh, our pop culture still today? You know, you see it even uh, in reality shows and, you know, whatever, anything. And you're also seeing it actually on uh, YouTube a lot. Uh, there are lots of uh, channels and videos and podcasts dedicated to uh, the mafia and the mob and I think a couple of people who have been at the forefront of this were uh, are um, one I think is his name is Graviano something uh, Jackie Graviano or something he was like a hitman for the mob and he did time and um, I guess he got a, uh, he got out or something. I, 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 I don't remember. But he's he's on a lot. He's he's on a lot of different uh, podcasts as a guest. And I think he also started. Oh, Sammy the Bull. That's his name. Uh, I think his name is Sammy the Bull Garviano. And um, I, I I see him a lot. Uh, you know, I don't watch it, but you know, I see the thumbnails, and you know, you could recognize his face. You know, he usually has uh, classic sunglasses, a little, um, one of those little uh, old school hats. And yeah, he was a hip man. So most of his stories that uh, you find on YouTube are like um, about, you know, what he did. But I, I think he, he's always very general and vague about it because. He still considers himself a, a a mobster, maybe, or in terms of the the so-called you know code of ethics of not um, of not sp speaking about uh, what you did or who you did it with. So I, I'm not sure he's he says as much as he. Well, none of them do. Obviously, none of them say as much as they actually did or actually actually no because i mean why why would they there's no uh there, there's no pros there's only cons in um in saying everything i guess uh but another person uh who actually sammy the bull graviano had a face-to-face -face, um meeting with is uh michael francisi and similarly to Sammy, he's, he was also uh, in the uh, New York mob. Uh, I think they were in different families, right? Because, uh, you know, there's like different families, Lucchese, Genovese. Um, I think there's like three more or something like that. Uh, Colombo, obviously. Um, I think, no, Colombo, did, did Colombo have... Uh, did they have their own family or they were originally part of another family or something like that? Um, so Michael Francesi has a little bit of a different story compared to Sammy the Bull Graviano because um, 
because he did his time and apparently he confessed to everything. And, um, and I think now he has his own YouTube channel where he does podcasts regularly, where he like reviews old uh, mob films and uh, explains little uh, inside uh, knowledge and, uh, and stories. And, um, but differently from Sam, I think Michael said at various times that, um, that he's really, um, that he's completely out of that life. And, uh, I think he, uh, turned his life over to, uh, God and he's really proud about being a family man. And I, I think he's also doing ministry. It's possible. So I think uh, he has different um, income streams. I think it's uh, the YouTube channel, which is doing pretty good. I, I don't know if it's going, it's doing as good, uh, you know, enough to, you know, be a real income revenue. But um, other streams are probably his, he, he talks and then, of course, his uh, church ministry. I don't know if he started his own church or he just became an ordained minister as part of another group, as part of his, uh, another church. And uh, so he has really interesting stories. Uh, but this is just a recent example. So if we want to go back to the start, from what I understand, um, Obviously, the American mafia, the American mob, um, came to America from Sicily, right? From Italy, from the old country, right? As immigrants. Um, I think the majority of uh, immigrants coming from Sicily uh, from from what I was able to kind of uh, look up and, and and research, the the majority of the people coming to America from Sicily came um, in the between the second half of the 1800s to the second half of the 1900s. So. Uh, roughly ballpark would be between 1858 and 1950. And, you know, these were um, very poor immigrants uh, who today we would basically consider economic refugees. Um, so they were coming from Sicily because there had been a, um, a big change uh, in Sicily where um, when, the, when Italy invaded uh, Sicily, the um, Sicily was, became no longer, was no longer part of, I think it was the Spanish Empire, the Bourbon Empire. Right, that's why the Kentucky whiskey is called bourbon because uh, there was bourbon territory there as well. There was uh, Spanish territory there as well. So, um, so Italy um, took over Sicily around the same time. The immigrants uh, from Sicily started coming to New York, started coming to the U.S. So, uh, it might be because of. Um, after the uh, in Italy invaded Sicily, the people became more poor. I mean, they changed, you know, the, the government, cha you know, completely changed. And obviously, economic times and hardships changed uh, because, for example, um, Sicily was uh, one of the biggest producers of uh of ships in terms of shipbuilding so the um and also 
I think there were like a hundred. Uh, there was like uh, one of the biggest companies uh, in transatlantic uh, travel uh, was based in Sicily. Uh, and I think they had like something like a hundred ships. And those ships would um, go back and forth between uh, Sicily and America, uh, bringing, uh, bringing immigrants there. So the changes in the uh, economic landscape and the political landscape changed the, um, the, the quality of life in Sicily, and that probably triggered uh, a lot of those immigrants to move to America because the immigrants that came to America, those immigrants did not have anything. I mean, if you see the old um, Ellis Island photos, I mean, they're crazy. The, the, you can see literally how poor they are uh, by just how malnourished and disheveled they look. You know, some are basically carrying uh, cardboard boxes as their luggage, uh, stuff like that. So really, really a uh, hardship. The people that came to New York and later would uh, create what we know today as uh, the uh, American mobster, the U.S. Um, crime families. Those people came uh, between, uh, yeah, at the, almost at the end of the 1800s. And so since the American mafia actually started in Sicily, um, let's, let's see how it all started in Sicily before we moved to America. So... I don't know what the meaning of the word mafia is because in different places where I found information on it, uh, different people had different meanings for it because uh, I don't think it's a word that is uh, directly um, coming from Latin, for example. Uh, so I'm not sure. Ch- really sure about the meaning but the other synonym uh for the word mafia is uh cosa nostra now cosa nostra is the name specifically for the sicilian mafia right all of sicily has uh, it calls it the Cosa Nostra. And for some reason, uh, so Sicily is broken up into different provinces uh, like uh, Palermo, Trapani, Agrigento, um, Messina, Catania. Um, Yeah, I don't, I don't remember all of them. I just read them now. Um, And so they all um, have the name Cosa Nostra. For some reason, some people are saying that um, the province of Agrigento instead has the word Stida, uh, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but which should mean a star in their Sicilian dialect. So for some reason, that's what they call it in Agrigento, the star. But the Cosa Nostra, the, uh, its origins are old, but nobody knows how old, right? Because obviously there aren't any historical records because it is, uh, in its essence, it is a 
secret organization, right? So it's so secretive. It's not like, you know, they ever operated out in the open, right? Because since it is basically a, like a secret society, it doesn't um, have any old literature about it, right? Like, I think some, uh, some books say that the, um, the start of it was because of the Romans. Um, so the ancient Romans had, um, a, they, they kind of invented the clientele system. I don't know if that's how it's called, right? Basically, it's um, a favor system, right? Like you do business based on exchanging favors, right? Today, we would call them, you know, bribes, right? And so in ancient Rome, which was uh, part of Sicily, uh, which, I mean, Rome conquered Sicily, so Sicily was part of the Roman Empire. Um, I'm not sure if it was part of the, the Roman Republic or if Rome conquered Sicily uh, after the Roman Republic became the Roman Empire. But either way, when a the ancient Romans conquered Sicily, and they obviously brought their, their customs and their systems. And uh, this way of doing business conducting, uh, um, do, doing, you know, being a politician, being a merchant, right? I mean, merchant was the only, kind of the only form of, you know, what today we would call businessmen, right? Most of them were in commerce and they, they worked as merchants. So a lot of this, um, this way of, a society working based on f favors, right? So I do, I'm a uh, Roman senator, so I'm going to do you a favor, and you're a merchant, and you're going to, you know, give me some of your free product, you know, some of your products for free. So there was al always an exchange that wasn't, uh, always uh, money-based because the ancient Roman society, you know, wasn't um, such a heavily money-based society. So, you know, cash bribes were only a small part of it. Most of it were, um, you know, commercial favors political favors, you know, how I help you gain more power, you help me gain more power, stuff like that. So the uh, power was a huge uh, currency, as it always has been and still today, right? So some would say, some could say that that was the start of the kind of uh, mafia culture, mafia mentality, right? Because mafia culture and mafia mentality, uh, a part of it is that we exchange favors. That's we help each other out, right? There's, um, there's a way of moving uh, forward in society. There's a way of uh, gaining uh, status and clout and, and, and and cash and money and power, and that's exchanging favors. And or when that doesn't work, there's bribes. And after bribes, you know, uh, it gets a little bit more heated. You know, uh, well they they take care of it in another way, right? But there aren't any historical records of that type of system. I mean, of course, there's always been crime, there's always been criminals, and we already know what the oldest professions 
the the oldest profession is in the world and so there's always been some level of criminality but in terms of you know mafia organized crime there weren't any records the first records i think are from the mention of the word uh mafia could it be in like court documents again like in the 1800s or in the 1900s but i think it was just like a word uh mentioned in passing it wasn't like um you know the it it wasn't a specific court document dedicated to that phenomenon but it was just in passing and nobody really talked about it and nobody it wasn't part of the legal system like uh you know police couldn't arrest somebody from for being a member of an organized um crime syndicate or a uh, part of the mafia because it wasn't I, i i don't think it was even ever recognized um by the legal system as something uh bad uh until the late uh the late uh, 1900s so the first yeah the i think the first big mafia move like that it like the first time that the mafia was in the newspapers uh could be in the um in the late 1800s where a a local politician in the in the uh state capital of uh Palermo in Sicily was murdered on a train and um so this politician was murdered on a train and um there were some rumors going around that this politician had been murdered because he was speaking out uh against the mafia and this was like the first time that anyone including a politicians was starting to speak out against it and so i think they uh, murdered him because of the uh because of you know uh because of the fact that he was uh condemning condemning what they were doing or you know going against them and uh, shedding light on them and they didn't want that so that's how they took care of it and but i think that was just like you know it was big news everybody was sad but i don't think anything changed uh everything remained the same and and the that's that's about all we know um until a couple of incidents right because in the 1800s what happened was that the when italy um conquered sicily the the old guard in sicily the old ruling uh families in sicily they were all um aristocrats from the spanish empire right because since sicily was part of the spanish empire all the uh landowners and aristocrats in sicily were um barons and princes and uh dukes and stuff like that right so those were all the basically those were all the were all the rich people who controlled commerce who controlled uh the political system and what happened was when italy took over sicily 
you know, what you always do when you conquer a new territory is to make sure you know that you, to make sure that everybody is on the same page and they know that you're controlling them um, and you're the new boss. Uh, what they did also in this case is they um, took away a lot of the uh, economic and political power that the old families connected to the old Spanish regime had. And so what they did is they tried to find new partners, right? It's kind of like they, you know, we still do today, right? When we um, take over a country, the first thing that we do is we do, you know, regime change, you know, and we do that regime change by, you know, finding new people to put in power and uh, to do our work for us. So how the Italian royal family did when they conquered Sicily is they found new allies in the up-and-coming class, the first bourgeoisie class in Sicily. So the bourgeoisie class was made up of the new rich, right? The new families that became rich through business, through especially through commerce, right? And a lot of these families be also became rich because many of them had started out working for the aristocrats, for the ruling families, right? So the new rich started out being working as, for example, um, guardians for their summer villas, their summer palaces, right? Because during the winter, uh, the ruling families would probably be in uh, the city taking care of business. And so the, they would hire guardians to stay in their land in the countryside uh, and take care of their land for them. Slowly, the people who were taking care of the ruling class's land started taking over um, their, their power. How? Well, if... If the family is away, if the ruling family is away from that town and in the, and they've put in place a guy to take care of their business while they're away, eventually that guy is going to be the guy with the power in that town because he's the one boots on the ground, who's in the territory daily, right? So he's the one uh, taking care of what we would call today as the uh, human resources because the farmland had to be taken care of. It had to be uh, farmed. And the, that, was, that was where most of the ruling family's wealth was coming from because it was old money. And old money would come, and in today still does in some cases, would come from the land, right? Because the land is something that you would be able to inherit and keep in the family. And the land was also a symbol and a reflection of the family's power on the territory. And the land was also the main source of income for these ruling families. Because in Sicily, in the 1800s, it was still a feudal system. It was still a pre-industrial system, 
because the industrial revolutions that had already taken place in, um, in England, in Germany, in the United States, were uh, nowhere to be seen in Sicily. There was no industrialization of Sicily yet. It was just farmland. And the ruling classes lost their power by losing their connection with the land and with the people of the territory. So the local uh, powerful people slowly took over the power of managing the people on the territory and of the income from the land, right? There were different ways of extorting and intimidating the ruling class into giving up, you know, in it little by little bits and pieces of their power, right? So this was probably a very, very uh, gradual thing. This was, this was not an over, overnight process, right? So, you know, one year you steal a little bit of land and, um, you know, they, they don't notice or they, they do notice, but they're, you know, they're aristocrats. So... You know, we're talking about, you know, the idea of how a gentleman behaves, how a, um, you know, that's where the name come, came, the name came from, where you say, you know, um, a man of honor, you know, the whole idea of honor was based on the, um, poor people trying to copy copy the rich ruling class and obviously this whole idea of uh, honor uh, came is basically a bad copy of the whole idea of honor in terms of the um, aristocratic uh, ethos and ideas right so so that's how the first uh, mafia that we know of uh, came by taking over uh, the power of the old ruling class in Sicily, right? And a lot of these uh, first mafia bosses, they started out, you know, living on the streets, uh, dirt poor, and then they slowly climbed the social ladder to the point where they became more rich and more powerful than, than, their, than their old employers. And a, an ex, a very subtle example of this whole process uh, of the Sicilian Mafia in the 1800s uh, was uh, written by um, this author who wrote this book called, I think it's called The Leopard, or, the, yeah, I think it's called The Leopard or something, and his last name is like The Island, um, next to Sissy Lampedusa, and I think the, I've, I've seen the film, also, which is directed by uh, Lucchino Visconti. And it's a really uh, beautiful film. And it's, it's starring, I think, Claudia Cardinale, who's beautiful, and Burt Lancaster. And it tells a story about, you know, the slow downfall of the old, an old aristocratic family and the and the new class of uh, rich people taking over. And so 
that created slowly a, a hybrid system in Sicily where the mafia trans had its first transformation, right? It transformed itself as a simply um, simply a code of honor and a way of life between farmers in the countryside and fishermen on the coast. So in its initial form, it was a more than an organization because when you think of a, uh, an, when you say criminal organization or when you say organized crime, you're thinking about s something that is a part of society, right? But it's kind of not part of society, right? Or if it is part of society, it's part of society as an external, um, as an alien object, right? As an external element. But at, when it started, it quickly evolved, and this was as its first transformation, because it evolved from its start as society. It wasn't, it did not start, the mafia didn't start as a part of society. The mafia started as society, as the system. And this is because if you think about it, the Sicily was never Sicily was never um, never ruled itself. Basically, it it always had somebody from from far away come and take it over. So since the almost since the beginning, we have the conquering so literally sicily i i tried to look at the uh timeline uh but uh, of who conquered sicily when but i don't think i found a single um a single time in which sicily was uh acted you know was able to exist as its own country, as its own territory, with the self-government. Because from what I saw in the timeline, it was conquered by Greeks. Then it was conquered by Phoenicians. Then it was conquered by the Romans. Then it was... And every time someone conquered it, they would run the island for at least a couple hundred years, right? So Sicily was so Sicily was conquered by the Greeks, by the Phoenicians, by the Romans, by the Arabs, and I think the Arabs are the ones who actually ruled Sicily the longest. They apparently ruled it for 600 or 800 years. So Sicily was part of the, the, the caliphate, I think. And I'm assuming that if the Arabs conquered Sicily for that long, for 800 years, I mean, think about America hasn't even existed for you know, America as a country hasn't even existed for, oh, more than 400 years. So if you double that, 400 years, 800 years, 
that's a long time. So I'm pretty sure that if the Arabs conquered Sicily and they stayed in Sicily for 800 years, I'm pretty confident that everybody in that island was, uh, was Muslim at the time, right? And, uh, yeah, so the, that conquest was only um, terminated by, I think it was the Normans um, from, from, you know, northern France and stuff like that. I think it was the same. I don't know. It wasn't the same people, but I'm pretty sure it was the same family uh that uh the Nor the same normans that conquered england with william the conqueror so more or less uh in those times and after the normans i think there were the french and then the spanish and then the italians and that's where we are today so i think that's the, that's very unique. I mean, I know, play, you know, every place in the world has been conquered at least once, but they've always had some, some years, some, some centuries, some time um, alone when, when they would be able to govern their own island themselves right but in this case it looks like the the inhabitants of sicily have always been held hostage by some foreign power and being constantly conquered by someone else and being co controlled by someone else and having your, um, your, 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 your territory taken away from you, your wealth taken away from you uh, constantly, it definitely does something to your psychology, to your mentality right that that has to change you i mean if you spent the last you know 3000 years you know 2500 years being conquered by other be people right if you spent over 2000 years having someone else tell you what to do then Obviously, that's going to have a really, not just, not only is it going to have a negative effect on you, but it's also going to completely change what uh, the Germans would call Weltanschauung, right? It would completely destroy and rebuild your point of, uh, of view on the world your way of seeing the world and when you are being constantly attacked and controlled it's probably physiological to react in a way of self-preservation right another if you think about it, another people who have uh, similarly but differently been uh, in a way attacked constantly are the uh, Jewish people, right? From Babylon times to Roman times, they've constantly been uh, attacked right up until today and they also they have a very strong sense of uh, almost a sometimes um, 
tribal sense of family, like this is my tribe, and um, you know, there's a way of defending yourself from outside attack, right? As a community, as a society, as a people. And my theory is that one of the possible uh, triggers that sparks that caused the, the mafia to start and exist in a certain form is, is the, um, the ability, the, the necessity to defend yourself from the Arabs, the Turks, the Normans, the French, the Spanish, the Romans, right? How do you defend yourself when your uh, when your town when your city is constantly being invaded and destroyed and uh, your sons and daughters are being kidnapped and something worse is, is done to your wife so your defense mechanism becomes this secret society where you you need a way to operate in secrecy, right? To communicate and be able to communicate with the people you trust. And you need to have a system where the outside world, the authority is bad, right? Because from their point of view, any authority, any form of uh, institutional power is automatically something negative because that power was not created by you. It was created by a foreign power that is controlling you and telling you what to do. So what you do is you create a system where you can operate and you communicate in secrecy to defend yourself from the authorities, from outside powers. And when you do this, you're, you, you have to set some rules, right? Because how you need to protect that secrecy with some rules. So then you have the rules regarding, you know, uh, what they call omerta, uh, not speaking about who you are or what you're doing or who you're doing it with with outside people uh, or else there's going to be some serious problems, right? And the whole idea of uh, being able to um, organize, uh, organize marriages and make sure that you know the marriages represent um, the political uh, assets and the exchange of power between families similarly to what you know royal families uh, d uh, did across Europe right you uh, marry you exchange um, you exchange children to marry each other and consolidate power and wealth, right? And so this system, which uh, ended up being the system that organized the daily life of the farmers, right? Uh, that became a way of life. Now, what happened was, since the poor farmers and the uh, poor immigrants that came to New York from those places, right, they didn't, they didn't speak English, they couldn't even read and write, they couldn't, you know, function uh, uh, like most of us function today, 
And, you know, imagine, imagine that, right? You arrive on Ellis Island, you arrive in New York, and you, you're barefoot, you don't even have any shoes, you, you're dirty, you, you don't have a dime, you don't know how to speak the language, you don't even know how to read and write in your own language, and you find yourself in New York City. That must have been rough, because if you think about it in terms of context, time-wise, uh, the example of Martin Scorsese's, what was that film with, um, about the, oh man, I have it on the tip of my tongue, the uh, New York film with DiCaprio, and it's like the 1800s in, uh, on the Bowery, I think it's like the, how the Bowery was, and there's the, that Daniel, I think it's like Daniel Day-Lewis, plays, I think it's Daniel Day-Lewis, plays a, um, plays a um, butcher. I don't remember the name of it. Um, but yeah, so New York in the 1800s must have been a lawless, crazy place. So you arrive in New York, you don't know anyone, you don't know the language, and you're dirt poor. I'm sure all they had was their system, the system they had to, to organize their lives, to, to be able to uh, communicate and help each other out, right? So that was how the mafia arrived in New York as a way to help each other, as a way to progress, and as a way to get rich, because obviously this was not a charity. It probably had the facade of a charity, but it was definitely not a charity. And we also don't know how organized they were, right? Because there's different levels in terms of how organized they were based on who they were and what the times were. Definitely the, the start must have been a wild. Uh, it must have, New York uh, with the first uh, mafia coming must have been a crazy place because if you think about it, each one of those uh, people might be part of the mafia, but might be part of uh, random groups that weren't necessarily uh, connected and certainly weren't necessarily friends between each other. So I'm sure there's plenty of uh, photos of the results of those first clashes when there was probably there's probably no power structure right because if you think about it the power structure in the old country was that each um each family controlled a uh, specific territory but as we said before, since it was based on the feudal system and since there wasn't a lot of industri industrialization um, and since the territory was, was vast and there was no infrastructure and the towns were really small, so in the old country, the power structure was uh, most of the time designed to have one powerful family that uh, dominated a town. But it wasn't just, you know, the small town of uh, buildings and houses. You're talking about a town. When you talk about a town, you're talking about all the uh, farmland around it, right? So probably at the beginning, they... 
I'm sure at the beginning, a lot of them didn't even have a vision or a mission about what they what they were going to do. It's not I, I don't think they came from Sicily to New York with a business plan uh, to see to knowing exactly what they were gonna do and what would they they were gonna create. I'm sure at the beginning it was only for it was I think it was just a random coincidence that the mafia arrived. I'm just talking about the start. It was probably just a random coincidence based on the historical times where mafia from Sicily came to New York. I don't think it was orchestrated. I don't think there was a conspiracy. And I don't think even the mafiosos themselves were coming to New York knowing that they were uh, trying to create uh, an organization, even though today we call them organized, they certainly arrived in New York unorganized. And I think it was only the lifestyle of living in New York. So the mafia became organized later on after the initial part of the more anarchy where everyone was against uh, everyone. The mafia became organized quickly after that initial part of anarchy where everyone was going against everyone. I'd say the maybe just more in a pop culture sense, but I, I think also, you know, socially and politically. I think the uh, American mob, uh, the American mafia that we know today really took off with, I'd say, with prohibition. Because also, if you think about it, in the, like, if you go back to, like, old newspapers before the prohibition the 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 most of the news was uh more about like you know who, you know fight fi fighting and you know the the street fights and the people who got hurt or worse so it was mostly like tit for tat, um, more about just, let's say, different entrepreneurs of crime trying to control the territory. So it was kind of like no man's land, each for his own. And instead, once they got organized, how organized they got really uh, came together with the Prohibition, right? Because I think the Prohibition was around 1910, 1920 or something, because I don't think Prohibition actually lasted that long, right? Um, it was definitely the beginning of the 1900s. And um, I guess it was because at that time there was a lot of like... Uh, moral crusade especially by religious groups against um the consumption of alcohol and those religious groups had a lot of clout in washington and held a lot of political power and had a lot of votes uh to give to the politician who did what they wanted so i think that was the big jump in quality 
for the mafia in the United States. I mean, if you think about it, all the we don't we don't really remember, and it's not really part of our pop culture. Uh, any mafia figures before prohibition, right? Because if you think about it, um, all the mobsters films we talked about earlier, all the gangster films, also were, um, you know, were about the the prohibition period. There's no really pop culture reference uh, going back before Prohibition. So I think Prohibition was really where um, the Mafia was able to in a, not only show its power, but also exercise it, right? So... And that came became clear how that power could also be transformed into political power, right? Because during the prohibition, you couldn't legally drink, so all these speakeasies popped up, and that's I think that's where the speakeasy was invented during the prohibition because. That was the whole point of the speakeasy, right? To be able to have a uh, secret uh, space who, uh, where uh, only uh, those uh, that were to be trusted could come. And that those speakeasies were, had to be owned and operated by people uh, outside of legal society, right? So the speakeasies and the traffic, the illegal traffic of alcohol was, uh, was what really, really, really made uh, the mafia. And with prohibition, the mafia couldn't operate on its own but was also able to work with other uh, alcohol uh, bootleggers and one of them was the father of uh, John F. Kennedy. So John F. Kennedy's father was uh, trafficking uh, alcohol from Canada to Boston and he was doing it you know as as a partner with the mafia and that's how the relationship between the Kennedys and the mafia started was during prohibition and you could say that that bond between the Kennedy family and the mafia was really the start of the political power of the mafia going straight up to the White House. Because before that, at least that we know of, there were no cases of such a direct uh such a direct link between a uh politician and between high society I'm, and the mafia cuz when you think about the mafia you think about you know the you think about just a bunch of uh, gangsters and mobsters and uh, people who have no education and who uh, dress, maybe dress vulgar and are loud and are aggressive and are violent 
and are trashy, you know, all those stereotypes, right? But then there's the other side of the mafia, as we could see start to happen with relationships of the mafia with high society, such as the Kennedys, right? So the Kennedys were trafficking alcohol and the mafia was helping them or working with them or partnering with them, right? So that relationship means that they have all the power in terms of long-term relationship building with someone who's going to be at the White House, right? That's why a lot of, um, a lot of people uh, were saying that the mafia was in on the Kennedy assassination because, uh, according to them, the long-term uh, relationship that they have they had had with the Kennedys was not uh, was not respected. They, uh, according to some people, the mafia got angry. Let's say that Kennedy wasn't holding his part. So, uh, according to some people, the mafia was um, was the the mafia got. Kennedy elected, right? So the mafia says, hey, we got you elected president to the White House, and you aren't um, exchanging with us what you promise. You're not giving us, we helped you get elected president. You aren't helping us you know, for example, getting the FBI off our tail or, uh, for example, changing the uh, laws so it's more difficult to uh, convict us for the types of crimes that we do or, you know, many, many, many other ways that Kennedy could have repaid his debt to the mafia for the favor. Right now, we think about Kennedy as like uh, a hero and someone who was kind of destined for um, this uh, sacred place in the American psyche, right? But at the time before his elections, there was um there was no there was no um reason to think that um someone like Kennedy would run for office and would win right obviously now thinking backwards everything seems like it was supposed to be but it isn't always that way right so the the other side of the mafia is the high society, right? Because one thing is the movie stereotypes, the film stereotypes. But if you're thinking of an organization like this, you are thinking about different players, right? So you might have the your typical gangster your typical uh mobster that does the usual racket but as it has evolved it has uh reached and inserted itself into higher levels of society in both politics, in both uh, business, in the legal system. So that is very different from the usual uh, stereotype of 
the gangster because if something like the mafia still exists right after um the rico laws were in, invented and implemented after um police all around the world are trying to um, f find and always continuously arrest uh, members of the mafia it feels like it never ends well it never ends because it's so well organized and not only is it organized because you can think okay yeah it's well organized all right there's a lot of things that are well organized it's not just the fact that it's just a bunch of organized gangsters. It's not. That's the whole point. The success of the mafia is because it is part of every part of uh, society, right? There's uh someone in the mafia working uh, in the legal system there's someone in the mafia working in the health system there's someone in the mafia working in uh banking and finance they are everywhere right they have their hand in every jar their finger on every button and this enables them to continue their control on whatever they need to keep their power and wealth and these are the people that you never hear about right because you know you hear about it every day um like you know that somebody got arrested uh for organized crime and stuff like that but the key to survival for this type of organization is to in a way become legit right it's kind of like the first, it's, it's kind of like a business, right? The first generation is the, 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 the generation that comes from poverty. And so the first generation, it's all about survival and that pure anger and violence that you need to survive on the street and even more if you don't want to just survive on the street but improve your life right so the level of intensity is very high in the first generation in terms of aggressiveness violence and street level crime and that's really kind of the founder generation and after the founder generation you have the establishment generation in terms of your dad started and you know he started in the most um aggressive violent way possible starting from the streets now the second generation is has the money that the father didn't have and the second generation also has a system already put in place in terms of network of uh, contacts but more importantly then the network the contacts or the money the most important thing that the second generation has from the start that the first generation does not is the 
level the status, the level of respect and honor that his family's name has that it didn't have when the first generation started, right? So the value of the reputation of the name is really taking, taken over and implemented uh, in the second generation. With the second generation, what happens is that they are still 100% uh, working in crime, but they're working in crime in a way that is, so to speak, um, more sophisticated, right? Because they're not just starting out, right? They have everything, the system in place. They've already um, inherited also their knowledge and their skill from the first generation. So they are just the most pure uh, form of sophisticated uh, crime. The third generation is at another level where they start to go legit, right? So that means that while the first generation didn't even have a middle school diploma, maybe the second generation had a high school diploma, but the third generation, they definitely are going to be uh, sent to, to college because the, their dad wants to make sure that somehow, some way, they find um, a mechanism to enable the family to start to make the switch during the third generation. And they start to make the switch by starting to incorporate higher levels of interaction with so-called regular society, right? So the third generation is the one that is getting a uh, degree and that is getting a, a normal job as a cover for the real activities that he's doing in the uh, back room. That's how they could start laundering money. Now, they could start, they could, they, they already have thousands of ways to launder uh, money, but this is not just about laundering money. This is also about how you appear to the rest of society. So once you have a real business managed by a person who really knows what they're doing and, you know, that they study, which is the third generation, then you can kind of start to clean the image uh, of the your family name in terms of being able to participate in upper middle class uh, society, maybe be able to get into some private clubs, golf clubs, being invited to uh, the right parties, uh, your wife being able to enter different circles of uh, ladies that she didn't have access to before. And after the third uh, generation, this is, all the uh, this is all theory, obviously, because 99.9% .9 of the time, they don't, they don't survive. They don't last that long. But in theory, going to the fourth generation, that's really the final goal is the fourth generation. The fourth generation is the one that not only 
is uh, obligated to go to college, but it's also obligated to uh, get a specialist degree, right? Uh, mostly the mostly a JD if they become a lawyer or an MBA to become a businessman, a banker, a CEO. And uh, in a lot of cases, also a doctor. Obviously, these three jobs are very important to have for the son of a mafia boss. The most obvious is the JD to become uh, uh, either a lawyer or a judge or a politician, right? That way, you know exactly what your limits are as a, an organization because you have at the head of an organization somebody who already studied the law as much or if not more than the people that are going after him, right? It's a very good strategy because what's the best thing that you can learn to understand what your opponent is thinking than studying exactly what your opponent uh, studied and studying exactly the tools, the legal tools that your opponent is using to take you down. The MBA is also an obvious choice because that is that enables you to learn how to better launder the money, how to better manage the money, and how to create really a legitimate business where your past crime heritage and inheritance and inheritance is um becomes it can hide away and now you have a sim simply a successful family business and they nobody can take that away because you've done it if, for such a long term and in such a sophisticated way that you don't even see the crime the third uh it being in uh, get it, going to medical school and becoming a doctor is not so much technically uh, obvious as the other two, but it is obvious in the sense that historically doctors are the pillars of the local community, the heads of the local community. Who do you trust more? A lawyer, a banker, or a doctor? A doctor. So a doctor usually has a lot more power in terms of the appeal of a sense of trust with people and a sense of power. But it's not such an obvious power like the legal power of the legal professions or the financial power of the business uh, community that is a much more much deeper power because it's literally the power of life and death and it's 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 not a coincidence that the same power the same power of the same power of life and death that a doctor has it's it's analogous to a certain power over life and death that a mafia boss might have. So once you reach the fourth generation, you're inside the system. You are inside the system. So that's what creates such a gray area in the system. That's one of the things that makes the mafia invincible. The fact that it is no longer a part 
of society. It is society. It is in the hospitals, in the courtrooms, in the banks, in the golf clubs. It's not just a bunch of gang gangsters uh, trafficking some substances or extorting money or uh, blowing up uh, buildings. It's something deeper and it's something that is completely part of the system. And it's also about part of the mentality. And the mentality that we have as a culture, right? The, the idea of money and violence as a tool for power is something that is equally part of American society and part of the life and the vision of the mafia. Everything can be resolved with either money or violence. And that's what creates the gray area when it's not all black and white. You don't know what, where the mafia ends and society begins a lot of the times. And that's even more obvious in places uh, like Sicily where it started. Because today in Italy, you have different types of uh, mafias, right? Where the original supposedly started in Sicily and it's called the Mafia and, and Cosa Nostra. There are other regions in Italy that have their own mafia with their own names and their own rules. And all these other mafias, or most of them, are or originated either as a direct extension of the Sicilian mafia or originated as criminal partners of the Sicilian mafia. And those regions are all in southern Italy, and the one in uh, Puglia is called the, I think it's called the Holy Sacred Crown, which is a very, very interesting name. I don't know the meaning of it, but it's, you know, if you think about it, it's, um, um, it it kind of has sacred, sacred, um, sacred, holy crown. It has definitely that that some spiritual connotations to it. Also, some historical connotations, some aristocratic connotations. Uh, the other one is the uh, Camorra. Now, the Camorra is from the region of Campania and Naples. And that one, I think that one um, was the one that was mo on most equal foot historically uh, together with the Cosa Nostra. So the biggest bond uh, partnership historically was uh, between the um, Cosa Nostra and um, Camorra. And Camorra, in different times in history, uh, surpassed Cosa Nostra in terms of, uh, in terms of power. And, you know, they, 
they are next to another region which is equally important and that other region also almost touches Sicily and it borders it, which is Calabria. And Calabria has another organization called uh, Andrangheta, which I have no idea what it means. It's very, very, um, very unique name. And um, they have, based on some uh, recent news, I think this this Andrangheta from Calabria has, in the last couple of decades, surpassed uh, both the uh, Sicilian Cosa Nostra and the Camorra from Naples in terms of power and wealth. And the Andrangheta, the, 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 the unique thing about the Andrangheta is that they have a more uh, closed system compared to the others in terms of families they literally say families and mean families while you know in new york the the the, the crime families in new york for example the lucchese the genovese that's very that's a very broad term if you know people who are not blood relatives of the Genovese can be members of the Genovese or of the Lucchese or whatever, historically, right? And the same in Sicily, where, you know, you could be part of a crime family, but you don't have to be blood relatives with the head of that crime family. In Calabria, with the Ndrangheta, it's different because they still uh, respect the bloodline. So you are only part of the family if you are blood relative uh, to the head of that family. And that obviously creates a more secure system of trust, of communication, because these are not simply business partners who you do crime with, but these are your, your mother, your uncle, your cousin. So it's a much more tight-knit system, and it has uh, uh, branched out everywhere. It, it is, it's said that the Mex- both Mexicans and Colombians um, prefer to deal with the Ndrangheta because the Ndrangheta is, um, is the most... Um, serious the most ruthless they do what they say and they say what they do and uh, they have no room to uh, waste time so they have a lot of power but the the cousin rostrin in sicily has apparently in the last couple of decades apparently has had a tough time uh, because of the uh, police crackdown and um, prosecutors cracking down and you know the funny thing is that recently this whole uh, re- this whole um, deep dive uh, that I did on the mafia recently was because there was this recent news of the head of the Sicilian mafia, who I think his name was uh, Matteo Messina Denaro. Which is interesting because his last name uh, I found out literally means cash. So, and he was caught recently. It was in the news uh, everywhere. And the what happened was this guy. I um, I saw a photo of him getting arrested. He looks like he might be in his sixties or late late sixties. Maybe, I don't know. Um, 
So this guy apparently was um, was from uh, this fisherman town or near the fisherman town, um, and he got he was the son of an old uh, local mafia guy, and um, and he uh, this is all allegedly because you know I'm I'm not a lawyer I'm not I'm not a judge uh, I'm I'm literally just repeating the stuff that I read on the news. Um, so he was um, he grew up in a mafia family. He was in that life, and he was just living in his small town and uh, carrying out his business. And the what happened was, I think he he was like a child. He was like a child prodigy. Like he was very, very successful in 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 doing that type of business right off the bat. Um, was making a lot of money uh, very young, and afterwards the 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 head of the mafia at the time i think it was um provenzano or uh rina basically what happened is the head of the sicilian mafia uh brought him under his wings and i think he did that because the other head of the Sicilian Mafia was friends with Matteo's father. So since the two heads of the Mafia were kind of in competition, since Matteo's father was friends with the other Mafia boss, this Mafia boss decided to take under his wing his permanent son, right? Kind of to kind of complicate things, or you know, just as a, uh, to to uh, get back at his opponent, right? In some way, somehow. So when he did that, um, uh, Matteo cont- continued to grow in the organization, and then um, he. Um, he was the um, allegedly he helped um he was allegedly he was working with the heads of the mafia at the time to help um put bombs uh to be able to silence uh the judges and the prosecutors who were working on some a bunch of high profile cases against uh Matteo and his um his people so what happened was the police got wind that there was some that that he was responsible for something for 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 a serious crime like a shooting or something and um so the police started searching for him this is this is from the news the police started searching for him and so he instead of ser- turning himself in became a fugitive and he was on the run and he still worked as a mafia guy but he was simply on the run the italian police couldn't find him and he continued to conduct his business uh but the police couldn't find him right and the police had said oh you know uh, maybe we found them in belgium and there were all these uh different information from the police uh about where he might be and how the police was looking for him and how they were going to find him and all this stuff so he was 30 years fugitive on the run nobody knows where he is there was some rumors about some uh olive oil refineries in morocco that he owned uh, and so he might be in morocco or who who knows who, wherever else right so 
The thing is that in these 30 years, his boss, right, went on a rampage where allegedly they were working together on this, where they um, put bombs uh, in, in highways to uh, get rid of uh, prosecutors and judges. And it was, you know, it was very, very, very intense. It was like, it would almost look like some sort of um, civil war uh, where there was um, acts of, literally acts of civil war going on. And this was all the mafia's doing. And the head of the mafia um, at the time, who was Matteo's boss, um, finally got caught, and the other one also got caught. So slowly, in those 30 years, uh, this guy, Matteo, became the boss because everyone else uh, was either dead or in jail, right? So this guy's the head of the mafia for 30 years, a fugitive. Nobody knows where he is. And he's caught. He's caught one day in a clinic, like a medical clinic. I guess he had some uh, medical issues. So he had, he, he had gone into the clinic for like a, a test or a doctor's clinic, uh, a doctor's visit, right? And the police arrest him in his town, right? basically in his town after 30 years in a medical clinic. How is it possible? I mean, how is it possible that the head of the mafia spends 30 years as a fugitive and when the police catches him, he's just living a normal life. He's still living in his own town, in a house in his own town. He's driving around in his car in his own town. He's going to the doctor's visit in his own town. This guy spent 30 years being a quote-unquote fugitive on the run right under their nose. He was right in front of them. He was hiding in plain sight. I think the only precaution, I mean, I'm sure there were lots of precautions, but the main precaution was uh, he simply had a driver, driver's license with uh, someone else's name on it. He just took someone else's identity and that's it. He would just drive around for 30 years. And the funniest thing, the funniest thing was the police. They were, they seemed so proud. You could see them in the, in the photos on, online. All the, all the newspapers all around the world. You know, photos and videos of... Uh, Police applauding each other, patting each other on the back because of this great success. The great success of catching the most wanted man in the mafia who was a fugitive for 30 years in his own town. How, how is that even possible? I have no idea. I really have no idea. The only answer is he had help. He had help from the inside. Because there is no way that an entire country's police force is looking for the most wanted man of the mafia and they can't find him. 
Not because he's living in, in China. Not because his, he's living in Brazil. No, 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 no. He's living in his own town. And you're like, okay, yeah, he's Italian, so you know maybe he's in another Italian city. Maybe he's in Milan. Maybe he's in Rome. He certainly has the money for it. No, 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 no. He's in his own town. He's a fugitive in his own town for 30 years. And the police only catch him now. And apparently, the police didn't even catch him. Apparently, he's, his health is so bad, he, he's so sick, that he was the one who staged everything to get caught because the medical treatment that he needed was too complicated to get without being caught or something like that. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. There must be... Could you imagine... I mean, this is... Obviously, this is Italian police. Could you imagine if the head of the mafia was in Austin, Texas, and the FBI knew that the, F the head of the mafia was in Austin, Texas. And, well, and then what happens is born a guy who's born and bred in Austin, Texas becomes the head of the mafia. And the FBI start to investigate he start he gets he becomes a fugitive right because he knows they're investigating and the fbi doesn't find him for 30 years when the guy still lives in austin texas for 30 years clearly clearly the police knew exactly where he was clearly he had friends in high places, in very high places. There is no legal, social, scientific explanation for how the head of the mafia was hiding in plain sight for 30 years. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this, please click the uh, like button and subscribe to this channel and watch this next video.